Okay, this time we're going to take a look at another real-world type example. We are going to deal with cars and them, unfortunately, crashing into things. There is a makeshift car, and we have a wall right here. We're going to assume that this wall is more or less immovable, so it's not going to go anywhere. So what we've got, I'm going to say that our car is starting off with a, an initial velocity of about 25 meters per second. So this guy's moving at almost 60 miles per hour. And we're going to have a situation where... Ah, we're going to have a situation where this guy runs into this wall over here. And after the collision, we've got a situation where the final velocity is going to be equal to zero meters per second. That's usually what happens when you run into a wall. You, you come to a dead stop. With any luck, not, not an emphasis on dead. So I will also tell you that the mass of our car is equal to 2,000 kilograms. I hope that's not too high. We'll bring that down some. Good. Yay, smart board. Okay, what I want to know is what is the force subjected to this car? So we're going to use impulse. And the equation that we've got, impulse, is equal to our force times our uh, delta t. So in other words, the time that the collision takes place in. I apologize. And that is going to be equal to our change in momentum. Okay? So, we've got a situation where I want to find the force. I'm going to give you one final piece of information. I'm going to tell you that this collision, at least starting off, we're going to go with kind of an old school car here. And we're going to talk about some of the safety features that we put in cars and why they are there and how they have the effect, basically. We're going to start off for our first one and say that time is equal to approximately uh, 0.01 seconds. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And this deals with a car that basically does not have much in the lines of what we call crumple zones. And we're going to deal with that here in just a little bit. So we're going to find this, this impulse. We know the time. This is actually our delta t. That's how long it takes for the car to impact on the wall. Yeah, I wish it would have combined those, that's fine. And so it's, that's the time it takes for it to go from its initial velocity down to zero. So basically the time it takes for it to hit the wall and come to a stop. So we're going to find our change in momentum. We start off with a momentum of the mass of the car times our initial velocity. So this is our initial momentum. And we're going to compare that to our final momentum, which is the mass of the car times our final velocity. OK. Well, when I plug the values in, I've got the mass of the car, which is 2,000 kilograms back up there. So I've got 2,000 kilograms times my initial velocity is 25 meters per second. And my final, well, my final velocity is going to be zero meters per second, so I know that my momentum in this case is going to be zero kilogram meter per second, or newtons, newton seconds. I'm more of a fan of kilogram meter per second. So when I multiply this out, I know that my initial momentum equals, let me check my notes here. Did I actually write it down? No, I didn't. So, we'll multiply that out. Comes up to 50,000 kilogram meter per second. And that is going to be to the right. How I set this up, that's usually going to be a positive direction. So we're going to have that as a positive. Okay? Our final is, of course, zero kilogram meter per second, which gives us a position where we can find our delta P. Delta, as we have mentioned many times in class, is not just the change in, it means specifically P final, in this case, minus P initial, 
Remember, delta is always final minus initial. Okay, well, when I plug these in, my P final is here, and my P initial is here, I find that my change in momentum, delta P, is going to be equal to negative 50,000 kilogram meter per second. Remember, momentum is a vector. It has direction involved. I'm originally starting off going to the right, and I have something that brings me to a stop, which means that is going to point the opposite direction. It's going to point to the left so that it can remove all of that positive velocity that I've got there. Okay? So that's my delta P. It points to the left according to our sign here. And we know from impulse that our impulse, which equals our force times delta T, equals, well, delta P in this case. That's going to mean that it equals negative 50,000 kilogram meter per second. Okay, well, I know my delta T. In this case, we said that it's kind of an old school car, so no crumple zone, so we're going to have something that I've surmised to be on the order of 0 0.01 seconds. That's assuming that the actual amount of crushing of the car is on the order of 10 centimeters or so. That's just a rough estimate. And we plug that guy in. So we've got a situation where cleaning this up some, we've got our force times 0 0.01 seconds, that's the time it takes for the collision, is equal to negative 50,000 kilogram meter per second. In this case, I want to get the force by itself. I want to see the forces involved. So I divide both sides by 0 0.01 seconds, my collision time. That gets me my average force. Basically, if we looked at the force as a constant as, a, as the collision took place, we would find that our force is negative, ridiculously large number. Let's see. Divided by 0.01. That gives us that the force is equal to... Five, one, two, three, one, two, three. So five million kilogram meter per second. Well, if that's my force, I could find my acceleration by saying my net force equals mass times acceleration equals, I'm sorry, that's a negative. I dropped my negative because it's still pointing to the left, which makes sense when we look back up here. The force applied by the wall when the car slams into it it's going to be back to the left. So that makes sense. Cool. So if I find my acceleration, which will be this divided by my mass, this comes up to about, oops, yeah, negative 5 million here, kilogram meters per second squared. My acceleration in this case is going to be something along the lines of 255 G's. That's a whole lot of force. A whole, whole lot of force. That's double plus on good. If you go through and you solve this instead with something that's a bit, maybe not fully realistic, but a bit more modern, where a car has something called crumple zones, Basically, it's part of a car that's specifically designed to be kind of like a can where you can crush it up, right? What that does is it elongates the time when this thing crashes into the wall. That can change our delta T to something like 0.1 seconds or higher. When you carry back through on this, partly because it's a linear relationship there, we'll find that the acceleration with crumple zones is going to be something more like 25 Gs, which is going to be a lot, a lot nicer. And there are some other things that can be done with modern safety techniques that really help with this. Now, some of the other things that we could look at, which is a bit longer problem, but we could look at what happens if you don't wear a seatbelt, which I would very much not recommend wear a seatbelt. So, but this is applying impulse on a situation where a car is slamming into a wall, not a great one, but, or not a great situation, I should say, 
but it does give us something where we can begin to understand some of the ways that they design cars to make them safer. We can change the values, basically the forces that people are, have applied to them in a car wreck, by changing the design of the car.